Dr. Anubis, how are you? I'm good. Can you hear me? <laughs> Do me a favor. And, oh, yes, I can. Loud and clear. Okay, good. All right. If you guys have got any questions, get them rolling. Uh, we should be ready to go. I'm just turn up on the far side, and we're up on YouTube. Move that over a little bit. Maybe I was being a bit actually. Hey, that dude, Rich, can of bless. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another show. There's Cheddar Bob. You you can lay there and and and, and help today. So we'll, we'll have that. We'll make that work out for you. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think that that's going to be our only option. <laughs> Well, we will have a fun show that is coming kind of here. So anybody in chat that wants to come over, come say hi. The link is in the description. If you want to come ask a question in person, if you want to ask it by just throwing it in the comments here, um, go ahead and do so. We will try and get to every question that we can as quickly as we can with uh, being uh, with as much respect to our moderator's time and speaking. Um, but also trying to move through because I know there's lots of questions everybody has and and this is a great opportunity to do so. So we got a small stage right now, um, but we will obviously have more people join us a little bit later. I'm looking forward to it. So I do see that people are rolling in the chat and starting to ask questions, um, but we do have a member on stage already. So we're going to give them the opportunity to ask the first question. That dude, we will get to you in a moment um and as everybody rolls in just before we get started i'm gonna let everybody introduce themselves that way every time um to roll in and and, and join in case there's other people that join you and uh what you what's exciting in your new year and then cheddar bob and then evian and then that uh, Matt, which will invite up, come on up and say hi if you're available to come join us for a conversation. If you have some good tips, you can throw them out there. Uh, and then uh, we'll go through that and then we'll get to Gabe right after that. And again, if you want, go ahead and raise your hand now and join the conversation. Um, and we look forward to digging into it. So, Anubis, what are you? Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Anna Schwabi and um, I. I am, I guess I'm a scientist, researcher. I have a background in cellular and molecular biology and population genetics. And my PhD work was focused on looking at variation in cannabis with kind of a backdrop using genetics. Um, and let's see, and I'm in New Jersey right now, working with a company called Shore Organics, um, using aquaponic methods to grow hemp. Um, and let's see, what am I looking forward to in the new year? Oh, uh, hmm. I haven't really thought about it. Hmm. Mm, I don't know how to answer that question. So I'm going to pass it on to uh, Cheddar Bob. That's me. Uh, I'm Cheddar Bob. I am a 20 year home grower. Um, my background is basically making lots of mistakes and learning from them. Uh, and, uh, yeah, that's, that's about as deep as, as, as I go. Something I'm looking forward to in the next year. Oh, it's probably still being here after all this mess clears out that we're going through. So, yeah. I guess that's me. <laughs> Hi guys, it's Evian. Um, I... Hmm, that's a fun question. I am uh, a longtime plant person. I've been touching plants and teaching uh, permaculture and other things for almost 18 years now. And I have very extensive experience in the regulated cannabis market um, in Oregon. I've been doing that for the past six years. And I also have a lot of experience with uh, large scale nursery production and breeding in both the hemp space and the regulated space. And I am a teacher at Oaksterdam University and I've taught at Hemp University and other places as well. And I kind of consult in the field and I just love all things cannabis and plants in general. So happy to share information and happy to be here with these other kind people. And 
looking forward to 2022. Uh, you know, just so there's a lot of cutting edge science coming out around um, around cannabis. And I feel like it's one of those things you could learn something new every day. So I'm kind of like a lifelong learner. And I feel like there's already been a lot of fun stuff happening this year within the space. So I'm kind of excited um, for maybe some shifts in the marketplace also. So uh, this is Evie and I'm complete and I'll pass it to Matt. Hello, Matt, also known as Gnarly Roots on Instagram. Uh, I'm a huge plant um, you know, like advocate and kind of a citizen scientist. Uh, I have um, you know, like education in greenhouse management and sop and, wow, sop, soil and crop science. Um, but I much, much, much like Evian, just love plants and the science and what they can all do um, across the board. <clears throat> especially you know cannabis and uh like she also said this year's already been exciting for science um and uh i think it's going to be an even more kind of exciting year as it goes on um so yeah pass it over to gabe gabe you want to go ahead and ask the first question of the day brother or sister yes. i'm not too sure yes i would i would love to ask a question so um Next question. So, the general question is how do I eliminate uh, uh, aphids? So, what I've attempted so far is Bulvarian Bassiana. Um, and I'm told that either that would work, or now the second. Uh, treatment that we're using is called velifor bassiata and so my question is is what so the in the directions call for it to be mixed and and mixed for 30 minutes prior to use but i'm wondering if i can store it mixed um it's been mixed for about a week and it smells different than when i mixed it so i was wondering if first of all anyone has any super crafty ideas besides I'm getting ready to kill my entire crop, I believe. I, I, now I'm told if I put something in flour, the roots will taste different to rice root aphids and they will leave. So they'll go to my veg plants. I, I'm just struggling with this, but I guess the real question is, can I store Velifor bassiana in uh, uh, already mixed? That's all I got. Hey, Gabe. Um, I'm pretty familiar with Bovaria bassiana and th those kind of the brand name products that it's sold under. Um, and those, I believe it's, you're gonna be losing efficacy um, really steep, like it's gonna be a steep drop off. Um, you know, they're, they're alive at that. Or actually, I'm not sure if they're alive or if it's just the sport, but you don't wanna leave that mixed for extended amounts of time. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly what it was recommended, but I, whatever it says on the label, you're not really going to want to store it much longer than that. And it's going to, you know, be dramatically um, just ineffective, but it will work great. Um, another thing that you might be interested in looking into is some sort of um, nematodes um, that will help take care of some of the, the um, root aphids, but I'm currently dealing with some, some myself and I just use some Bovaria bassiana um but yeah i would not recommend mixing large amounts of that and storing it i want to concur with everything that johnny's saying just really quickly and also say you know it really i'm a i'm a big fan of um of uh bavaria bastiana also and i but i feel like it needs to be part of generally a three-pronged approach anytime you have a uh, more serious issue with something like that. And I just was sending a friend recently some, you know, it depends because you're already so far in flower, but there are certain things. I'm not sure what, what market you're in. You're allowed to use certain things in different, in different states and not in others. And I feel like usually what's recommended is some sort of like drench or sprench. And I've, I've found very good luck with Azagard in in addition to uh like i i'm a big fan of not all the very bastiana is created equal i will say so what johnny is pointing to with efficacy i will say that there are definitely superior products on the market and um you know i know what i feel comfortable using but i'm 
but I, I definitely see different, different efficacy with the different, um, I guess it would be strains of Bavaria bassiana. So I just want to put that out there as well. And also, yeah, you can't store it even, I mean, it needs to be used like day of and mixed very well. And also I definitely want to just put it out there because this is other people are listening is that you need to wear a mask when you're mixing uh, that as well. Cause it's not good to inhale. So just a few things about that. It, if I can jump into here too, as well. So, so Gabe, I just wanted to ask a question. I think, I don't know for sure, but you said that you were going to flip your plants into flower and you heard that they would leave. So your, you, well, your main problem is essentially you have an aphid population. And do you have a photo of the, like, the type of aphid that they are? Are they like on, do you have cover crop and they're on your cover crop? Are they on your physical plants? Are they starting to really chow in there? Like what, what level of, uh, of situation are we talking here? It sounds like they're pretty dire. Um, but like, uh, just can you clarify a little? Like, are your plants going to? Are they dying, or um, are you uh, are, are you mitigating the problem pretty well, and they're still in the vegetative state? Okay, so um, I have reference from a woman on uh, Instagram named Suzanne Bug Lady. I'm sure a bunch of you guys are probably familiar with her. She identified the bug as the rice root aphid, and she's the one that's been guiding me through this process. Um, it, so that's another thing that's confusing to me, right? Because I noticed it on the transplant. So she told me to put the yellow strips at the bottom of my plastic pots where the holes are for early sign of detection. And she did say to use a three-step process. So the other process that I'm using is safer soap or I use suffix oil for killing the adults. And that is done every three days. And then every four days, I'm doing a 90-second soil dunk. I've done this twice. And no, so now I'm doing a lot of this work to keep these things at bay, I guess. I still see them moving when I check, but what's confusing to me is all of my plants and flower are extremely healthy. So it's like, I, I'm not sure which way to go. I, I'm going to flower everything and reset. I've taken clones of my mother's. Everything will be reset, but my plants are extremely healthy and it doesn't seem like any of the bassiana that I'm using is killing them. So here, so Gabe, that stuff has like a seven-day window before it really starts uh, starts to do its thing. Um, so I don't know if you started applying kind of recently, but yeah, you want to at least give it like a week to to see it in action. But if your plants are healthy and you're treating it like this, you're you know you're not in a horrible place because I'm sure that stuff will start to do its thing and and it works really well once it starts working. Um, so I, you know, it sounds like you're, you're taking the right steps to, to, you know, getting a, a hold on this. Totally. I want to agree with, uh, Johnny and just say that, you know, pretty much in my world, what Suzanne the bug lady says is pretty much like, <laughs> you know, we listen to what she says pretty, uh, pretty strictly. Um, I will say I'm a huge fan of, um, the, the products that you, that she recommends and that you're using. I find that Cephoil X is one of the most beneficial products that I've found in a really long time. But also, I just want to point out, since you already mentioned it, it works really incredibly well for spider mites. I've actually never found. Some people do take issue with mineral oil because of like plant cuticle stuff, but I, I honestly, I, I feel like the plants like it and I think it works really effectively and is just a more natural product. I will say that you know, I have worked with uh, Kip from BioWorks, um, BioSafe Solutions, uh, and I just, I love their recommendations. And so I'm assuming that you're using BioSeras WP when you say that you're doing that, because that's, I think, one of the better. And, and like Johnny said, it does take a second to work. But, you know, I will say for root aphids, what Kip recommended to me was uh, the drench and sprench with uh, Azagard. And, um, you know, I've, I've had, I've, if it all depends on kind of like what sort of knockdown you're looking for, but I'll, I feel like if your plants are healthy and you're pretty close to flower, I wouldn't really worry about that. Um, I will say that when you reset your room, making sure that you're really doing a thorough job cleaning because they're super sneaky buggers. So I would just be extra cautious on your next turn and really follow extra protocols to make sure that you are not continuing the problem. 
Uh, now, a root aphid is a little bit more. Oh, sorry, Cheddar Bob, go ahead. Um, I was just going to say there's also the approach of predatory insects. I'm not sure which ones necessarily affect or will go after uh, root aphids, um, but I would imagine some Swirsky or H. Miles, uh, rove beetles and such would be a good thing to introduce for, for, the, for the soil dwelling larvae and such. And there's even some, I know this is going to sound crazy, but there are some, um, <clears throat> uh, what's the term I'm looking for? Uh, some, some other, like, I guess, aggressive, you know, like aphids that you can, um, you, you know, like bring in that will, um, you know, like knock those down too. I think it's aphidus irvi, um, and then cucumeris as well. Um, <clears throat> but, one thing too, uh, you know, cold press on top of everything, you, uh, you know, cold like press neem, um, when done like back to back can really um, start to like, at least knock them down um, to get more, more like control, um, you know, which is another one. I just, I, I want to say, I, I think that both Cheddar Bob and Matt are correct. And I just will say that if Suzanne the Bug Lady didn't recommend beneficials right out the gate for a problem, the, you know, the, one of the reasons you don't always want to start with beneficials is because if you have a serious enough population or infestation, and I'm more just saying this for the audience in general, because if you have uh, a more serious problem, sometimes you, it requires some sort of knockdown before you can actually introduce beneficials. I'm a huge fan of, of that route and just using biocontrols in general. But I will say that if you're having um, an actual pretty serious infestation, it just can become kind of like a waste of money, especially if you're in some sort of scaled production and you also don't want to kill the beneficials. So, um, and I know that in some markets you can't, like you can't use just straight neem. So that's why the Azagard or there are certain products that are allowed within generally within the regulated market and California has some of the most stringent rules. So that's where when you can't use neem, you can use like uh, a neem based product like as a guard or something along those lines. Totally. And, and that's like such a, a fantastic point to even kind of you know, bring up with, with like IPM to note that the, 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 the like processes in which you kind of like initiate these things are very important. Because you can, like you kind of noted, put something in and then turn around and think that you're doing great by, you know, spraying neem or, or spraying you know, Asagard and just delete everything that you just like put in. So it's best to find a very um, systematic way to go about your, your, um, you know, controls. So thanks for being yeah, that. I, amazing. I learned that the hard way, I will say too. <laughs> so, you know, I just will say I'm a huge fan of beneficial insects. And I think I learned the hard way that if like if the problem is too extreme, and I think that Suzanne has helped back that up over time for me in my head, where it's like if you know, just like getting a hold of the situation before you just um jump in and uh and respond with biocontrols. You're also in an interesting situation, Gabe, because it's a root aphid, and I'm not like I mean, rover beetles, yeah, there's not, like, hypo is not really going to be able to take on, like, a such a large, like, it's just probably not going to work. I'm not really clear on a lot of large predatory brute defending uh, bugs. Is anybody else aware of any? Like, I, I heard the rover, I heard the hypo, but he's, he's kind of, like, rover I can see, but I, I don't know about hypo. I'm wondering if there's anything else that, that anybody's seen available on the on the market or in general. There was a there was also a secondary question that is very related to this, is where would you guys suggest uh, purchasing uh, beneficial uh, microbes? Because this is actually, ben not beneficial microbes, but uh, beneficial predatory insects. And I think this is really important because if you don't get them fresh, they're fucked. Um, so like buying them off of eBay is sometimes not the best idea. Um, so if, if you guys want to jump in, it looked like Cheddar Bob was opening up. You want to start? Yeah. Um, I Fortunately, I started my bet off with beneficials, and I, I, I always add them about every three or four months. Um, but I, I use uh, Beneficial Insectary, who you can order through greenmethod.com. Uh, That's who I use. And uh, I forgot the other thing that I was going to say. So 
there we are. <laughs> Did you have a, a have a predatory insect for uh, root, root aphids? Is that maybe? Yeah, thank you. Um, I was thinking, like, I'm not sure about how well, uh, is it millipedes or centipedes, whichever ones, or maybe uh, pill bugs might, might help a little bit in there. But those are the two I was thinking of for some some penetration down deep. You know, like this whole conversation, and I just figured out who it was. I was like, man, somebody's been posting about root aph or about rice root aphids, and it's um, sink uh, sink angel. Um, he's got a couple posts on it right now, which is pretty pretty timely, I guess. I was gonna say the same thing. Is that um, I'm pretty sure. Uh, uh, Matthew Gates is going to do like a root uh, aphid, some sort of IPM primer, and maybe it's, he's working with Future Cannabis Project also. Linda and I just wanted to point that out because I think it's coming up. And I have a friend whose facility is having major issues. So that's part of like, it's like fresh in my mind because I've just been sending them all of my data. Because I think it's actually one of those things that I haven't had to deal with as frequently. But when they do come, I, I mean, I just think they're gross. I mean, big aphids are like the nemesis at this point so um i will say and i will say chair bob i'm just curious what your concept is there with the pill bugs because i've actually had them turn um especially in like living soil um, in the past i've had issues where they actually started to eat the cannabis plants like root like got like out of control and just started to really like hit the cannabis plants hard so i don't always view them as a beneficial i view them as beneficial in the compost but i've had them get out of control a few different times and actually start eating like the stems of the plants yeah i've i've also seen that and it seems to uh, the the instances I've seen, they seem to be in like newly transplanted or, or younger plants. Um, I know Blue of Green Tank uh, has had a few times where he's had issues and he's actually just wrapped the stock with aluminum foil and kind of tuliped it out. And that stops them from uh, going going up the stock and chewing on it. So, but but yeah, they, they can get out of hand. Um, it's it's something to, to definitely keep your eye on. Yeah, I've, I've had them kind of get out of hand in, uh, in my living soil bed where they were definitely at night, they would come up when the lights were off and really like just be hitting the base of my plants really, really hard. And then once the lights came on, they kind of go back to wherever their, their little holes were um, so they can get out of hand quick. But yeah, the, it's crazy how uh, serendipitous things have been with the root aphids. Like I... Um, I've seen all those posts in question and then, and then I'm like, just kind of looking at all my plants, checking out the roots and um, one plant's not doing so hot compared to the rest of the others. And sure enough, like I don't, I was thinking about root aphids. I'd seen it a bunch. I pop the, the pot off and I'm looking at it. And of course, yeah, there's freaking root aphids all on this plant. And it was actually um, from a team that I bought at the Emerald cup. I uh, bought like, four or five clones in a teen. And of course the one that actually had soil mass um, gets through, I usually, I have an IPM protocol before I bring things into my house. Um, it involves soap dunks and, and sulfur. Um, and of course, you know, soap dunks and sulfur aren't gonna, gonna kill root aphids. So yeah, they like snuck past my, my uh, regimen and I brought them in the house, but yeah, they're just, they're super prevalent and honestly I've had them in my four by eight bed and I was really worried that they would be like a persistent chronic problem. And after a few treatments with the, uh, it was either um, bio series or um, Botanigard, one of the two um, Bovaria Bassiana products and it, they were gone, you know, they never resurfaced in my four by eight bed. So there's definitely hope on getting rid of them. They're not like, um something i'm super super concerned with um but yeah interesting stuff i think that's a really good point i mean i think also that what you said before johnny that they can take a little bit of time so being patient with those products um sometimes is because they don't work immediately but i will say too just on the where to look for good biocontrols is i've also had good luck with um BioBest, and I've I've worked with a bunch of different companies over the years. I think for me, it's like the 
the ease of shipping is a big deal for me. And then also like the population, I think you start to learn who you can trust and who you can't trust. And um, I feel like making sure that you're very clear with your tracking, because if you this is definitely the sort of thing you do not want to forget about in your mailbox, especially when it's hot outside. So just keep that in mind um because that has also happened <laughs> like nobody checked the mail to get the thing and then it's like it's just a bad you know it's, it's a very they're very expensive and you want to just treat them like gold a little bit go for it matt you you, you wanted to jump in there go ahead bro. oh i just you know like pill bugs are just so so fun like every time this like conversation comes up i always like to bring up the fact that they're land crustaceans, just like a mind fuck, you know, like, I don't know, it's just really cool. They're, they're like in the same family as like crabs and everything. I, they're, they're really cool. We have, so I'm like next to the ocean being in Vancouver, BC. I mean, everything will probably be relatively the same, same kind of space. There's probably a few people on the panel here that are in relatively the same space and we have masses of them. I can actually set up a small plastic container and put it up against the wall um, during spring and fall and collect them by the by the dozens like i mean huge volumes of them um and they're, they're but they're not they, i find there there's there's a food mitigation issue like they'll attack your plants if there isn't stuff to go to and there's a few plants that they really goddamn like is is turnips um they really like eating my turnips um so if you throw some turnips down it might be a little bit helpful uh with that type of thing but I, I think there's also needs to be this food source. There's that imbalance there. I, I think we touched on a great couple points with like, A, not jumping right to beneficial pests and, and making sure that you follow kind of, not beneficial pests, that's a terrible term, uh, beneficial insects, you know, predator pests, predator bugs, um, and, and using those, but after a certain amount of time and making sure that you're not just gonna throw, throw them into a neem infested area. I myself, Evian use BioBest. Um, I think they have a great lineup of products uh, and there, there's a lot of interesting stuff out there. We actually have an amazing um, panelist that we're gonna bring on in the next couple of weeks at the Dank Hour 2 uh, that is a Canadian Quebec company. And they have some like, they do a lot of work with the universities here in Canada. I'm not gonna speak for him, but uh, they, they do a lot of work with the, with, the, with the universities and a lot of other crops in Canada and have found a couple new and interesting kind of pests that they've been rearing. Um, so that'll be kind of neat to, to check out. There's this one that's apparently just a voracious eater of aphids. Um, and it's a little, and it's a spider mite, and it's a large, it's, but it's a large, little, large, <laughs> large, little red spider. So it's pretty cool. Jason, welcome to this stage as well. Um, did you have an alternative method that is not commonly thought of for dealing with root aphids, rice root aphids, to be exactly specific? Since I've already said your name. I do not. I just want to add one quick Can thing. Can I just jump um, in real quick and say? Go ahead, Gabe. Oh, sorry. So I just, so I wanted to say thank you guys so much for all your information. And then the two things that I, I wanted to, um, that I, I think it was really important about what everybody said was, first of all, I've noticed it is a three-pronged att attack. You can't just do one thing and expect it to go away. It's um, a diligent process and very meticulous in you just have to be very meticulous and and not give up relentless on killing them first thing the second thing is we had mentioned two people suzanne bug lady helps me 100 percent for free on all angles and all levels and zenthal wanted to charge me 250 dollars for a console so he's very good i'm sure all things good but for the audience, Suzanne is willing to help 100% for free. No, I did pay her after, but she's very helpful. Gives a lot of information for free. Thank you. That's all I got. And Suzanne, the bug lady, yeah, she's like, she's pretty much like the authority in the space and has been for a long time. So I really, I really appreciate her. I've learned so much from her. And just on the topic of her, I believe that um, I just wanted to point everybody on the panel um, to one of my absolute favorite conferences that I've missed the past couple of years because of the pandemic is the um, 
is the Biocontrols and Biostimulants Conference that is going to be back on this year, which I'm really excited about. So it's March 1st and 2nd. And if you're interested in learning, it's um, learning about biocontrols and biostimulants. It literally is such an incredible um, agricultural event and just so much information. It's usually very cutting edge and they do um, a full day tract for cannabis, which is, so it's like you're alongside also a lot of ag other agricultural crops. Like there's like the point, I've learned a ton from like the poinsettia people over the years. And um, Suzanne, the bug lady will often be a speaker there as well. And I've, I think the last time I, I believe I missed the last one and she did a whole like day on aphids, which was, is really incredible. So the, the wisdom that comes through on that and to dive deeper and all of the best biocontrols, um, uh, you know, beneficial insect people are there. And then also it's really fast, it's fascinating to learn about biostimulants and crop steering. So it's just a, it's just a really awesome um, educational event. And I highly encourage people to attend if you want to learn more. Can I hit one more thing on the roly poly or you know the pill bugs if 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 we have time if that's cool or do we still want to focus on the root? Like I said. Yeah, go ahead. I'm just pulling up that conference thing. You just go ahead and, and yeah. touch on that, and then we'll start trying to dig into some more questions from the future cannabis project side. I, I do see a few of them up there. Don't be afraid to pop them in, and don't be afraid if you're in the audience to raise your hand and come up on stage and ask your question, no big or small, and we will dig right into it, like as 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 deep as the root aphid goes. <laughs> we will answer that question for you. Um, so if you, it looks like Jason has his mic open there too. So if you guys want to just go ahead yeah. and I'll get that posted. Yeah, I just, I, I did want to mention that uh, Suzanne is actually going to be speaking here in Massachusetts uh, out near the Sturbridge area. So kind of Western Massachusetts, February, I think it's February 12th and 13th uh, at the um, Organic Cultivators Supernatural Conference. It's uh, February 11th through 13th, and we're actually going to be talking uh, with Eric Brewer, who's uh, one of the main sponsors of that conference uh, tomorrow night on my show. Um, but yeah, Suzanne's going to be out here in February. I know she's at the Humboldt Regenerative Conference. Um, she's also going to be, I believe, at the Michigan and Maine ones uh, as well. Uh, so there's definitely some great opportunities to uh, to chat with Suzanne. Make sure you bring your tinfoil hat um, if you're going to talk with Suzanne as well. She's a big fan of uh, letting people know that bro science is not okay and that real science is the only way. <laughs> um, and, and she's very, very quick to uh, point out out and uh and and go after uh things that are really not accurate or, or not truthful and and so she definitely she'll even break out the tinfoil hat herself um and and has has worn it at least more at least once if not multiple times at uh the regen conferences so um yeah no she's fantastic and and matthew gates is also a, just a tremendous resource um they both have different approaches and backgrounds um and um they actually don't necessarily see eye to eye on a lot of things actually so <laughs> they've had some interesting run-ins between the two of them but they're both just fantastic resources um and i love chatting with both of them they're really wonderful uh, sources of knowledge awesome let's jump into the next question so we get answering some of them uh, gabe i hope i gave you every last little bit that you want and if you guys want to see some creepy bug aphid pictures evian don't look at my profile I, I popped a couple of reels up because like I said, I am, uh, it's that, it's that time of year where things are going from the cold to the warm. And of course my, my greenhouse is starting to take in some bugs, but I have, I have a small population of aphids. Actually, I have two types of aphids in my, in my tent right now, neither of which is touching my cannabis, mind you. So I will, I will let you know that they're in all sorts of other plants in my cover crop. Um, there's also a few lace wings in there and stuff like that. The population is getting a little bit higher than my my comfortability states but i think there's there's, there's a one last point that before we may move on to this next question that i really think is very important to touch on because you you, you spoke very strongly gabe about and like if you see these be on it destroy them go hard i mean this in this situation get that area clear fix it and then then look at moving forward and prevention but sometimes 
overreaction is exactly that. And, and, and just like when we get a virus, we get sick and our body overreacts and makes ourselves sick, we can actually cause further damages and problems in the long run. So say, for example, you know, there are other beneficial bugs that are about to approach these and they've hatched at the same time a little bit later to make sure that you're a uh, little bit, they actually usually hatch a little bit later to make sure that there are uh, pests in your plants so that they have food right off the bat. So like if we pull the trigger too quickly, sometimes we can really end up causing a lot more damage to the situation in general. Um, so I wanted to jump into the next question um, and, and not to add more complexity to your current situation, Kate, but- Hey, you let me, really quick, would you mind before you jump to that next question, I just wanna say something that I forgot with, it's just as far as the aphid conversation in general, cause what I did see your post and I, I meant to, I just have been working all day, but I meant to respond to you that, the, I've been a huge fan for years on all crops of like washing your plants is like that is literally your first line of defense and, and something that actually I felt so good about when I the first time I saw um, Suzanne the bug lady speak live that was what she said and I was like yes <laughs> I've been I've been saying this for so long and so I just want to say there's lots of different things that you can use there's lots of safe insecticidal soaps and just soaps in general but I feel like that is generally like I had roses um, my roses and my hops in my home garden both had aphids last year and that was the first line of defense. So when I saw your post, that was my immediate thought was like, wash the plants. <laughs> so just, uh, just want to put that out there because I think it's a valuable, th and, and also to tie back to what Gabe said, that's generally part of my three pronged approach, depending on how large a crop and like what you're dealing with and you're dealing with acres, obviously that gets a lot harder to do. But I just feel like in IPM in general, I just want people to keep that in their mind that generally a three pronged approach is what is necessary to tackle an issue. And, and one thing alone is not gonna be an answer or a solution for you. And I'm complete, okay. thank you. Awesome, thank you so much. So again, if you wanna come up and ask a question, go ahead. I do have a little bit simpler of a one uh, that I'm gonna throw over at you cheddar bob um while i dig up the next question which is actually pretty interesting about graphene so we're gonna talk a little bit and i, I got some good for anna but uh cheddar bob that dude asked how can i vent my bloom tent without letting light in and i know uh like like as always there's no question too big or too small and, and i'm sure there's been a few people puzzled by this exact problem so cheddar bob what's your solutions to this specific issue uh well i guess i mean there are these boxes that you can build those like kind of flow hoods that can go over the the exhaust um but are we talking about like an exhaust fan intake fan is that yeah i think they're exhausting they're exhausting their space and my guess is they have a probably an open hole with a fan in front of it um, so what would be your alternative there to make sure to cut off the light so they can manage their bloom site? Yeah, if it's just a fan and you don't have anything kind of leading out like uh, like the duct work or something, um, I would I would probably look into one of those sort of flow hoods. And if you can put ducting on like an exhaust fan or something, having ducting and then just having it have a bend in it somewhere so it's not able to let in the light. Um, the flow hoods work really good in situations where you can't put ducting on for sure. So here's here's the question that I have coming up for you, Dr. Anibus. I'm pretty sure that'll answer. I think I think we we hit it right on the bone. Is you just ideally you, you have some ducting leading in and leading out and you put an s bend in it or something and that will stop the light from getting all the way through um and that that's how you prevent it if you just have a fan you're you're uh, there's not a lot of opportunity there you could put you don't want to put something in front of the fan or by a motor like that because it's not exactly safe um but it, if you can you can get pretty cheap ducting duct fans even if it's just a booster and, and a little bit of ducting it'll help out um dr anibus if I graft a low yielding cultivar onto cannabis, onto a cultivar with larger yielding root system, can I get an increased yield? And I, I, I in theory, like, I don't know, I, I don't think 
information passes between the two other than nutrients so i don't think that you would get more of a yield but what would be your opinion on that i know you might not have a, a solid perfect answer on this because there's not a lot of people doing it but i just want you're correct i have no solid answer but i would agree that you know the bottom plant with the root system is a separate kind of it has a whole separate genome with different cells different expression than the graft so i would not expect the higher yielding bottom plant to pass that trait onto the graft um the grafted individual but i don't really know if that's correct or not so i would like 10 just like thinking about it logically be like yes 100 percent. but after seeing some um, cactus grafts of some really, really slow growing. And I know it's a different plant and it's, it's a whole different thing completely. But um, so a cactus that is really slow growing grafted onto a cactus that's fast growing and um, also can take more water. Um, the cactus that's grafted on top of that plant, um, the faster growing plant will actually grow substantially faster than um, it would if it was left to on its own accord so i'm not sure if that would have there would be any parallels in cannabis um but i wouldn't rule it out completely i think that's an interesting question similar with fruit trees also so i would just be i mean honestly i my question back would be like wow have you had success with grafting uh cannabis plants because that's like generally the first thing because it's not sounds simple not actually super simple so uh, i mean i'd love to see like i'd love i want to see more of it i'm kind of been fascinated by it for a long time especially with like i still have yet to see in person a cannabis plant hop uh, uh grafted to like hops root system so i'm like it's kind of fascinating i know that it happens and there's photography but i'm still i failed miserably at it and i'm i'm generally pretty good i have a pretty decent green thumb so but obviously I haven't put that much attention to it. So I'd be curious if other people have success because it sounds easier than done, I think. I agree with you, Evian. And I would also ask the question, what is leading to that? I mean, if you've grown different strains and this one just isn't a good performer, does it? Is it because it has, it, you know, it, it develops a crappy root system? Like it, what, what's leading to that trait that it's a low yielding plant or a low yielding strain in the first place. Um, if it's, you know, the root system doesn't just doesn't grow big enough for it to uptake what it needs to uptake, you know, then maybe grafting it onto a plant that has the ability to uptake more nutrients, more water, whatever may lead to a higher yield. But again, I'm not sure why. Um, it seems like a lot of work for something that's only around for one growing season. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. Uh, it's, it seems like a lot of effort for an annual. Uh, with a perennial, something that's going to be around for a long time, and you have that ability to allow that plant to adapt and, and adjust and then bear fruit season over season, I can see that. Um, I can possibly see the use of it if you're trying to save space and you want to graft a couple of different cultivars onto the same root system so that you only have like one plant instead of, and and be able to have a couple different flavors from it sure or give a plant limit yeah exactly um but i i, I still don't um other than a fascination right to, to see if it could be done or or just to play around i don't know what you would be gaining uh through all that effort and to me it would seem to out the amount of additional time that it would take for that plant to take all that adjusting before you would get anything useful for it you're better you'd probably grow two or three crops in that time and, and you're probably better spent time doing that i have a quick thought too because uh, dr anna i feel like you brought a good point up because this has kind of been an uh, interesting point for me and i'd be curious your perception on this and then other people's as well because i feel like there's some misconceptions that like all cannabis is high yielding whereas my understanding is how it's categorized and i'm not sure how it ties in you know 
on a deeper genetic level of the plant. But my understanding is that there's uh, three different classifications of cannabis and that there's high yielding, medium yielding and low yielding. And I kind of feel like this topic of conversation is not really it's just not it should be more of a conversation because not all genetics are big, big bud strains and a lot of the more exotic stuff and certain things you know you can just see it in the structure and i'm sure people who have been growing for a long time kind of know what i'm pointing to but the what i it changed my perception when i started to realize there are some genetics that i know that we've run historically like you know something six years in a row and it is never ever ever going to yield the same as a high yielding cultivar, no matter what you do, it's a, just a different structure. It's a different yield. Um, so I'd just be curious if you have any concept of that within like the, the kind of deeper construct of what that points to. Um, I, I really don't, um, except that, um, I, I mean, I, are you saying that, um, you don't you don't think that there are like if you have a highly higher it's something that has been classified as a high yielding strain it doesn't always have a high yield or like it, it varies from year to year and sometimes like i guess i don't understand what you're well, saying my understanding and i believe i learned it but there's some other plant scientists that i've learned this from in the past is that it's like not all cannabis genetics are created equal and so there are three different classifications. There are high yielding plants, mid medium yielding plants, and low yielding plants. And I think in the cannabis world, we have this concept that you can get a low yielding cultivar to become like a big bud high yielding strain just by based on what you're feeding it. But there really is, there's a distinct difference in the genetic structure of those plants, and it's never going to perform like a plant in the low yielding category is never going to perform in the same category as one of the high yielding plants. And so it's kind of, it changed my perception because I, I kind of viewed them for a long time, all as in the same, they're all cannabis plants. They should all do be able to do the same thing, but it's just not accurate. And I, I believe maybe it was, I've had this conversation, I think with Ryan Lee, and it's an interesting when you grow things historically it, it just changed my perception of like how something in the medium or low yielding is just never going to perform the same and you see this kind of in the data and the metrics when you're harvesting when you're like oh okay those plants could be treated exactly the same or in a similar preference but they're just never they're not going to cross perform i guess is the general they, they're, idea they're not they're not okay so if if you have something that's come from a population that you know, like if we we think back to before we came along and started messing with this plant, you've got a population that's growing and thriving in an area, let's say where it's on a hill and there's a lot of wind, those plants are going to be small. They're going to adapt to be small because if they were tall, they would bend over or snap and they wouldn't do well in that environment. So that environment has basically um, driven that phenotype to be shorter in stature so that it can grow well where uh, it, it, in the environment that it's living in. So if you have, um, you know, a plant that is, is a low yielding plant, unless you start crossing it with something else and doing something to it to introduce a genotype that is going to start yielding bigger, um, uh, bigger, flowers it's it's not in its genome to do that um just because of its history and things like that so you're never going to make a ruderalis plant it's it's never going to be a, a photo period plant just because you want it to be or because you put it in a photo period situation it's an auto flower it's going to you know um it's going to flower based on time based on maturity not um not on the light so a plant can only work with what it has in its genotype. You can't um, <laughs> you can't make it uh, express something that it doesn't have. So I would agree with what you you said that a low yielding plant is it, it's always going to be, be a low yielder, and and you might be able to get it to perform a little better if you give it the optimal conditions and whatnot. But it's never going to be a high yielding plant. Um, 
And what else? I just thought of something else. Oh, like, you know, if you have a lady finger banana, it's never going to, you're never going to be able to grow big Chiquita bananas. It's, it's a different kind of banana. Um, and they're always going to be small. So unless you cross yep. it with a bigger banana, you're not going to get a bigger banana. So I, yeah, I, I think this yeah. needs to be like shouted from the rooftops because I think people just don't under, I think people just expect all cannabis. I mean, it's like they see subtle variations, but they're like, well, why doesn't it perform? Like, why does the cookies not yield as much as the train wreck? Or, well, you know, it's just like, it's just never going to be the same. So it's just an interesting thing that I feel like is maybe not discussed enough. So it kind of begs back to the the question that uh, the, the user was like that, that, you know, unless you're going to, I would say you'd have better luck like Dr. Anna is saying, is like crossing those two things. If you want to increase the yield of that one plant, uh, you know, work with a breeder or learn basic breeding and and cross those two genetics and and see if you can uh, create progeny that gives you the desired result. It's, it's absolutely one of the things that a lot of the breeders do focus on, and they, they actually talk about as well. Um, I've worked with uh, my buddy Tom, uh, Green Team Genetics. I've helped at his booth a couple times, and you know some of his crosses. He had um, four different crosses, and two were one was banana. He had banana and a strawberry, an orange, and a lemon. <clears throat> so these he did these this fruit bound series. And those four cultivars, the lemon and the orange were much higher yielding plants. Um, the strawberry and the banana though were not. And, and strawberry strains, a lot of the time you tend to get a lot of golf ball size nugs. You don't really get necessarily the big spears. So, so it's definitely genetic um, and, and you can see it in the crosses and even stuff coming from the same breeder um, will show those different tendencies, even if they had similar parentage, right? Um, you know, it was one line he did that this fruit brown series where all the, you know, the, all the parents, all the females were crossed to the same male, uh, for these four different flavors. And, um, he got, you know, you're going to get different yields. You're going to get different bud shapes. Uh, the colas themselves are going to have different shapes. You have like big spears or, you know, you're going to get those popcorn, those rounded, um, you know, buds. Um, I know, uh, Kyle breeder of pure breeding. Also, he breeds a lot of his stuff where he's trying to, you know, he focuses more on plants that are going to be good for indoor growers in many cases that are going to stay shorter. Uh, a lot of his plants, they're just bushes and it doesn't matter how long I veg it or what I do to it. It's not going to get six feet tall. It's going to stay, uh, three feet and just keep getting wider and wider. So there's definitely, um, some genetic aspects to that. Um, and I've seen that, uh, even, even way back in the day. Um, and I think this is also something that has limited, some of the genetic variances and availabilities that are out there because again if we're focusing on a cash crop the amount of yield that that plant puts out is going to have an impact on whether somebody continues to grow it and so we've lost a lot of flavors and strains because people who are working in commercial space are very much focused on that yield percent that yield amount uh this is jason i'm done speaking that's such an amazing point. But if I can just throw in here as, as a point of reference, so the popping corn that you go to the movie theater, you love oh so much. The corn you see on your table, the corn, the, the popping corn you buy over the counter regular, 98%, I believe it is, I might be off by a few percent here, of corn produced in North America is, is the cross of two plants, period. Um, and, and, and it's And the only reason why this specific plant was chosen is due to the fact of its yield. Nothing to do with flavor, nothing to do with quality, only the fact that it had the highest yield per square foot, period. So it had nothing, it has nothing to do with how it feels or what it does or how good it is for you. The only root factor is yield. So when we look at industry, this is always the problem that we run into and, and Jason highlighted it oh so well, is that it's, it, it's all about the yield and how much money I can make and not what's actually there. 
um, the bastardization of, uh, of plants, as it were. So I do want to jump over and ask Jason a, a, another question, although on a slightly different subject. Um, Brooke Brown asks, and I think this is awesome because you did a show on this. Uh, Brock Brown, Braun asks, I figured silica uh, was covered, but what's an organic way to get more silica into your system? Jason, I know you did a whole subject uh, show on that. I'm wondering if you could uh, talk on that a little bit. So um, there's definitely a lot of things out there that can silica and silicates. Um, definitely go back and listen to my uh, sh uh, episode that we did specifically on, on silicon. Uh, and all the different uh, ways that you can get it. Um, but some of the, some really, really good ways to get additional silicon naturally uh, that you can add, there's things like uh, uh, aragonite, uh, which is a sea-based calcium that's high in, uh, high in calcium and low in magnesium and, and has some other really, really nice uh, additional aspects in it. Um, and that's a calcium silicate. Uh, you can also, what, one of the things that I really like to use is this uh, calcareous algae flower, uh, which is about 32% calcium um, and has a whole bunch of fantastic amino acids in there as well. Uh, and that's C-A-L-C-A-R-E-O-U-S algae flower. Uh, so algae, you know, A L. A L G A E, uh, and of course flour. Uh, so those are a couple different ways. Um, I also am a big proponent of rice holes. Uh, rice holes, as they break down, they do release silicon um, because it's part of you know what's in them. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, whether there's much silicon in uh, brown rice vinegar. There is not. Um, it is uh, that the the shells, the husks themselves is where that material is. It's not necessarily in uh, the outputs that come from like the vinegar or the core of the, the rice itself. So um, that's a couple of places that you can get that. Um, oyster shells um, are mostly calcium, uh, but they have a lot of silicates in there as well. Um, it, it's really trying to get some of those sea creatures um, because they have the silicates in them as well um, to, to add that in with your calcium and your silicon inputs. So hopefully that helped. Another great herb or plant that has high silica, it would be horsetails or equisetum. Um, that is something that I'm beginning to look at to start fermenting and incorporating it into my garden. It's a great, it's a fantastic bioaccumulator and definitely one of the items that's highlighted in a lot of Korean natural farming uh, guides to, uh, to use. Cool calm free too. All right, so I will do a quick reset here just so everybody knows what's up and what's going on at Comfrey with next about. I think we should have like a whole show about plants about side plants, like all the other plants oh that we can put with our other plants. Like, I, I, that would be so I want fun. It so bad. I think it'd be so cool to get like, if, if we could get like a doctor on exudates and a doctor on, 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 on microbiology around the root system and fungi and, oh, and like this. and then a plant doctor. Yeah, no, that's the yeah. goal. And, We're and, working on it every day. <laughs> <laughs> and and potent, pon potent Ponics mentioned, uh, I, I think it was one of the conversations in the last couple of nights, he's putting together a whole library of those plant to nutrient conversions for natural farmers so that they can uh, pick and choose from a variety of things to help get the inputs um, that they're looking for, the types of minerals or the nutrient that they're looking for. So Steve Raisner, Potent Ponics, uh, Growing with Fishes, uh, he's a fantastic resource as well for that type of information. And he is putting together a whole um, whole file on it. Um, and I think he, he actually just sent me a link to it. I haven't had a chance to dive in there yet, but I'm really anxious, uh, excited to, to take a look at what he's put together so far. Uh, that's going to be a fantastic resource. Awesome. So I got I got a I got a fun handy question that I'm going to throw over to Matt here. 
Um, and, and I think it's great. It's a nice, simple, but also, you know, a question that a lot of people run into in the, in the earlier time that I think it's really important to get onto. Hi, from Virginia, P Paige Foley says, when, when using plastic pots and saucers, I set up netting. How do I drain my flushes without moving the plant? Um, so my guess is that she's probably in like a drain to waste where she's looking at 20% runoff of the plant and she's wondering like how to mitigate that because you don't want your plant sitting in the water um matt do you have any um you know methodologies of, of of navigating this issue honestly i would probably say because i mean i've done you know like runoff in a while but i'd say trays um or if you can't do trays um get stands and then um if uh like you're you know kind of in a tent that's what those um first like layers are designed for is to like gain water so you can go and get um home depot has these awesome they're like i think like 15 dollars. it's like a shop back that goes inside of like a five gallon bucket and you can put your plant you know like stands up on that do your water through and then use the shop back to suck up any like excess water but that would probably be my my go-to like if you didn't have access to a tray the shop vac is is great actually for getting around and just sucking the extra water out of the bottoms of the saucers as well so um i know you know if the plant sometimes the plants are too heavy to move or to lift uh, you can just go ahead and, and suck the water out of there is one way. Uh, there's also, you know, I mean, there's hand siphons that you can get as well. Uh, they don't necessarily work as well, but you can go to the local hardware store and get a siphon that's used for fuel or something along those lines that you can use to pump, pump it out by hand if you don't want to buy a shop back. Interesting. Now, um, sorry if I, I, I open my I have my mic open for for an extra minute there. Um, my apologies for that if I interrupted you, but I'm just scanning through the questions. I'll do a re quick reset while we're running into this, and I think those are excellent points. If you have no money and a turkey baster, get a bucket. It's a good way to start. Um, if you need, if you need to fix the problem <laughs> right now, <laughs> that works. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, I, you know, I haven't. I, I've and occasionally I've sat there with a sponge. I, I won't lie. Like I didn't have anything that I could use handy, and I just used a sponge in a bucket and just kept using the sponge to suck up the extra water and and just squeeze squeeze it out into a bucket. I mean, that's sometimes you have to go really really manual. That's Mop dedication on a short right there. <laughs> I will say, I don't know how anybody even operates like growing anything like shop bags are so valuable. And now they have like that little like mini ones and stuff, even for people who are operating at a really small home scale. So I feel like shop and also just being super, I just want to say on the shop bag thing, just make sure you clean it out after every use because uh, that's like the really just needs to kind of be like become practice. It, that, that's why I talk about those ones that home deep like one day like I, you know i think mine had broke or something like that and i was walking through and i saw this one that just like clips on top of the five uh, like gallon buckets and i was like eh, it's super cheap i'm gonna try it and i haven't gone away from them like almost every grow that i've worked in i've brought them in and you can buy a bunch of them for super cheap and you know you'll get the work out of it even if it breaks I and mean, i've sucked up like pumice rocks with them and stuff and they don't seem to break that often but even if it does it's like i feel like you'd get your money's worth but yeah there are I think one of the most um, useful tools because you can pick up soil, water, anything you need. So uh, I'm gonna, just going to say we have about, we, we like to end this at about an hour and a half. So we usually end at about 5.30 in the evening. So, I got, so we get lots of time to jump into dinner for those that are um, on the West Coast. If you're on the East Coast, it should be good bath dinner. So I'm not too worried about you. If you have any questions, um, in the Future Cannabis Project side, or you have any questions in the audience, come on up because we're approaching the last roundabout hour to ask them no, no question too big, no question too small, maybe a comment or something that you would like to discuss that's been picking or nagging at your brain. Um, and maybe there's a way that we could chat through it and, and develop that. But again, we got about 20 minutes left, so don't miss out on that part. I see some more comments in the chat. Uh, Magnus asked a little bit earlier about um, where did you go? 
he was asking about using uh, Swartsky mites, if I'm off the, yes, Swartsky mites, um, and opening up the sachet and depositing them in the soil um, to use that as a defensive means for dealing with fungus gnats. Um, I'm not familiar of, of, of this. I'm pretty sure they just end up going right back up top. But uh, I think the first person that jumped in, Jason, go ahead, brother. Yeah, I'm happy to take that. Anything that's in a sachet is usually in a sachet for a reason. They're, they're meant to be a slow release. <clears throat> and so they're usually eggs and, and yeast and things in there to maintain the Swarovski eye or cucumerous or whatever the package is. So they're usually meant to be slow release. And so if you take them out and dump them out, you're going to lose um, probably a large portion of your population. So um, after the period that those sachets are supposed to be done, so um, the, the cucumerous sachets that I use, for instance, are supposed to last about five weeks. Once that five-week period is over, absolutely cut them open, dump them out. Uh, usually it's really, really, uh, the one, the cucumberus comes, that I buy comes with, it's kind of like a bran meal. Uh, so that's fantastic for the soil. Just let it go. Um, so that's that's my advice with the with the uh, sachets is you want to try to keep them going for the life period that they're supposed to be good for, and then you're free, you're free to take them and dump them out, and uh, you can dust them over your plants and and all those things as well. I just want to cycle back to what we said at the beginning of the conversation earlier when we were talking about root aphids is just to be reminded that one fungus gnat flyer um, can lay about 300 eggs and larvae at a time. So just make sure that like the balance, like you have a balance, whatever you're doing when you're trying to treat a problem like that. Um, and also when you're, we were speaking earlier to if you're, if you have an issue uh, the more complex, the three-pronged approach is great, but when you have things that have a more complex life cycle and fungus knots are one of those things that have a complex life cycle, not as complex as like thrips or something where it's like a six or seven part life cycle, but, um, you know, fungus knots have a pretty complex life cycle where they're in the soil and they're in the air. And so you definitely want to make sure that you're, um, you're, you know, making, whatever approach you're using that is actually targeting all the different parts of the life cycle. That's another amazing. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. Like was exactly depending on your pest, you have different issues. Like you talk about aphids, they're essentially born pregnant. Like the whole like gestation like cycle there is quite um like quite a, quite a task. So I'm glad you brought that up. That's like such a good point is like depending on the pest, like, you might have to attack a completely different way too. It's like, yeah, awesome. Okay, so let's see here. Do we have another question coming on the far end? Cool, thank you. Magnus says, thank you guys very much for the smile. JB says, H miles for get for gnats. That's good. So H U S O asks, is is star killer something that's well known in the U S? My guess is that is I, I'm not, I've, I've I think I've heard of this this strain before. Is this something anybody in the audience is anybody on the panel is familiar? Go ahead, Evian. Yeah, I, I, it's uh, it's been around for a little bit, um, and I mean it's it's a it's okay. I mean, it's not something that like blew me out of the water personally, but like it's uh, it's there, it's around. Not not something I have tons of commentary on, but it's like, yeah, it's uh, it's it's uh, it's here. All Anything right. Do we more? have? We have an, another question that comes to David Purcell asks, what's the best light uh, for under $400? And what's, what, what, what's a great option if I have a, a, an unlimited budget, but a small space? What would be your recommendations? Cheddar Bob, you want to go? Cheddar Bob is in terrible pain. I'm sorry. Back, so he might be a little bit yeah, slower I'm, than I'm sorry. Say, say that again. Uh, 
best budget light to get rolling that you might suggest and, and, and a light that you would, if you had unlimited money, what would you get as for lighting in a, in a, in a. Oh boy. Um, gee, best budget lighting. Um, you know, depending on your space, um, personally i think that uh like a 315 cmh is a good way to start you know it doesn't uh release as much heat as the the high pressure sodium or, or such um and it does have a really nice spectrum if i were going to uh, go with unlimited funds and stuff personally i'm a i'm a fluence guy um so that's that's sort of my go-to um that's yeah, that's it. Yeah, I, I just want to back up what Cheddar Bob's saying there because I feel like, you know, as far as low budget, I, I definitely have like had people who are also sourcing things outside of brand names. So sometimes you can find like the exact same uh, lighting setup for, you know, without the brand name on there. So that's kind of something to consider when you're looking. But also, yeah, I'm a big fan of. Uh, fluence if you if money is no object that's kind of where I tend to um, pivot towards when you need to be careful of your space too uh, especially in small spaces because you can only use so much light and, and so uh, this the sizing of the light is usually appropriate uh, the 315 is a great starter light I mean if you're really talking small light I've seen people do fantastic things with CFLs and a footlocker um, so, you know, it really depends on how small your space is and how low your budget is. If you've got a, uh, an old chandelier and some CFL lights, you can actually make a, you know, and, and do a pretty good grow. It, it's really about the setup and, and how you're trying to do it. Uh, but a CMH is a good starter light. They're extremely cheap because most people are buying LEDs these days. Uh, so you can definitely get a discount there. Um, but if I was going to spend some money, I would I would go look at the some of the spectrum tunable lights as well. Uh, Fluence makes a good white light, um, but if you really want to play around and, and be able to tune the spectrum and have a sunset and a sunrise and, and do some other things, there's some other lighting companies out there that have some really amazing stuff, uh, like Science LED, for instance, uh, which is the lighting company that I use and work with. Um, yeah, Bruce Bugby is actually doing a huge amount of, is doing a bunch of work with them now, uh, who's an amazing, uh, scientist. And, uh, they also were included in, uh, Ed's book, uh, his recent updates to his grower's guide. So, uh, look into spectrum tuning. Um, and if, it, if you have the space, uh, you can try to find our good friend's son, who's on here often, who has a light that actually is uh it actually replicates the sun indoors but you have to have a very big space because those lights are not meant for small space so that's my uh that's my advice. is that the is that the sun on demand because I, yeah. if you if, yeah. if you were if you were to you know i've i yeah. totally blanked on that that is probably like the premier lighting system that that one would want right. if uh, right but you need you need shape. space you need yeah. space because you can't use that in like a tent um, <laughs> you need it. You need, you need a space with some considerable, uh, ceiling, uh, room and, uh, you need a, you need a good canopy that you're going to use a light like that on. So I'd like to make a recommendation on a, just a cheaper, um, LED fixture that, um, for the price point, they're really good. Their customer service is good. And I use it, uh, one of their lights for my smaller little grow tent, um, and it's dimmable as well. It has like an on dim, uh, on the unit dimmer, which is great. So you can dim it as you need. Um, and it is a actually a Mars Hydro, which a few years ago, I would not have recommended you Mars Hydro, but now they have some white lights that are just, they're really good for their price point. Um, so like I said, and you can use them in a smaller environment and you can dim them so you could uh be growing in yeah pretty much like a locker um like jason was saying you can have these these things super close to the plants turned way down um they're really energy efficient and you won't have to worry about heating or cooling uh, or you won't have to worry about cooling your space which is really really nice i man i wouldn't even say mars hydro 
you know, like it's, it's that, you know, like bad to say back in the day, you know, like the 2015, 2014 era, when, when these things really started coming around, it was like Vipar and Mars that were kind of like leading the way. And I watched a lot of guys on you know, like Reddit, on like Grass like City and stuff that were pulling damn good yields. Um, it just took a little bit of like, you know, like dialing it in. And so, you know, like, and like I say like damn good yields, I guess I should say for the science that they were, that they had at the time and for like what they were paying for the light. Like there was like some some pretty good stuff, um, so like that whole like Mars hydro and like Vipar like uh, spectra like I I think even Doc Ray he runs like we were talking a couple weeks ago, um, he runs Vipar spectras for a lot of his veg uh, like stuff, um, so like there's some of those like cheaper end like LEDs that are you know like coming up um, pretty pretty like quickly. And then the only other thing I'd say about, you know, like lighting is, is, is especially when you're starting to spend more, really, really see like where they're getting their research data from. And if they have it, like if the company doesn't have their data accessible, like if you follow me, I jokingly like post this quite often is like the lighting, you know, like industry is much like the seed industry. It's a very snake oil there's actually very few people that are producing real research data. And you can tell this by, you'll go to the website and they just don't have anything or they don't like, they have no kind of like explanation on why their light does what it does. And if they don't, you know, like if they can't say that, I would not buy it. Or if you call them and talk to them and they don't really have like a lighting scientist or anything going on, I'd maybe shop around a little bit and just kind of like peruse and see kind of what else is out there. I just want to say super quick. I just want to say that also the very first question that I always ask is like, you know, dependent on whether somebody is looking at LEDs or a different source is, um, is also like your power. Um, just the very first thing, because I will just say that I've tripped breakers with pretty much everything in my day. And like, uh, yeah. So just just going to say that uh, right out the gate is just really, really knowing your power source, even if you're at a very small scale, because um, even just like basic lighting, if you're daisy chaining things together or whatever, you will you will trip breakers. So making sure, you know, um, know your power source and, and make sure that you're within your parameters. Well, I think it could, you could also say it could get dangerous. You can burn down your house. Oh, for sure. <laughs> that's happened too. that's kind like, of why i'm saying it yeah. <laughs> yeah like sometimes the breaker doesn't trip and then that wire gets really hot and then done 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 yeah, mm -hmm. for me i often there, there's one question that i always want to say actually justin here jumped in and, and said the same thing is, is kind of what is your space dealing with like where are you drawing air from is it hot or is it cold the hotter your environment is and the more challenging it is to get that temperature down, the more you're probably going to want to lean into something like an LED. The, the cooler your airspace is and the easier it is to cool things down, the, the easier it's going to be to use traditional lighting that generate a lot more heat. But it really depends on, on your environment. I think this is an awesome answer question. Now, we do have an exciting one here, and I think this will be a great way to finish up the evening as uh, with, with our last panelists for the day. But what I have... Sorry, I just want to make sure I get the name right. James Perkins. James Perkins asks, um, and I got this by email. James Perkins asks, I'm very excited to get growing this year for the summer season. What can I do to get started? I live in Oregon coast. maybe I would like to go jump over to Matt to, to, to maybe if you want to have some recommendations. Sorry, I was looking at the chat and all I heard was Oregon Coast. And then I, like, I was like, what? So can you uh, say the question again? I apologize. We have, we have an excited grower looking to get started for this year. They're wondering when they should put down seeds and, and it, or, or if they should just start looking for them or if they should start thinking about putting them down. Oh, well, um, first off, I mean, getting them out you're gonna be like after the middle of april and honestly depending on how big you really want the plants um and where you are on the coast if it's like north coast central coast or like south coast kind of really matters on like how soon you'll have to harvest so 
you kind of have this uh, like window of like figuring out if the strain will finish. And a lot of people like in the Northern area grow a lot of like the um, highness like cultivars um, because they're pretty quick um, like flowering. Um, but I guess you're gonna wanna be out, you know, like after like mid April uh, or sorry, mid, mid like June. Um, and then be like, like looking to like start wrapping everything up uh, around like the beginning of September, honestly, or like middle, middle or like end of like September is like when you like you should start hoping that like things are getting really underway. Um, and a lot of people out here on the coast do light uh, uh, do light depth for this reason, um, but seed wise, Eugene has an amazing amount of uh, stores that have seeds local. A lot of the dispensaries carry them. Uh, a lot of the coastal shops do in Tillamook and um, the store in Manzanita and a few of them in Astoria do, uh, do as well. And Eugene also is a fantastic source. A lot of the stores there, um, and I keep bringing it up because it's a little bit more central, so I'm not sure where you are on the coast. Um, Eugene is an amazing source for clones too. Like if you don't want to go from seed, you can just quickly um, go find some clones and uh, plant those down, which is kind of nice. I, I think that's great advice, Matt. And I would also add that, um, you know, just really making sure, because there are some genetics that do very well. I mean, my first questions would be like, how many plants are you thinking? And are you planning on, um, you know, do you have some sort of greenhouse space? Where do you want to start your seeds inside, outside? Um, you know, there's a lot of different questions. And if you're really doing small scale or um, different things, but just what works well on the coast versus what works well inland, there are definitely some genetics that have been bred specifically for the coast. So I'd be curious, Matt, if you have any experience with that. I know I can think of quite a few different, like different things, but I, I kind of would need like a, Generally, I love to know more. So it's hard when people are on YouTube because I like want to quiz people. <laughs> so like, yeah, it, that's why I was like, I don't know. Like, I'm just going to give a, like a roundabout. The only ones I know on the coast that really, at least from, from this area, are um, uh, the Royal Highness like crosses. That's what like everybody out here like seems to grow. Um, but um, I don't know if there's more stuff in like the southern like coast. It's kind of really clicky out here, like a very small logging town. Well, I'm sure you know, um, uh, but uh, yeah, it's uh, but um, yeah, I, I'm I'm not fully sure on what a lot of people are growing, to be honest. I would, being from the coast in Maine and dealing with, <clears throat> you know that that coastal issue of fog and high humidity towards flower. Um, I've found that the Royal Kush lines offer a higher amount of uh, like PM resistance uh, as well as bud rot. So that's one cultivar you could, you could look into. On top of uh, choosing a, a, a cultivar, you know, carefully for that environment where it's kind of humid and you're going to get lots of fog. Um, something that also you should maybe consider would be starting to learn how, if you don't already, um, produce lactic acid bacteria. Um, so you could start incorporating that in your, your garden and your, your regimen and doing a, a weekly or, you know, twice a week uh, preventative spray. Um, that stuff will, will help tremendously in that kind of humid coastal environment. Awesome. I think that's a great start for the amount of information I had. And I actually got that as a, as an email request there. So I, I, I wanted to make sure to take the time. They, they took down the road. I just want to make sure we take the time to answer it. Brian, welcome to this stage. Do you have a question or comment for our panel? Yes, uh, I was uh, having the same problem getting my plants to finish here in Oregon, the, what you're talking about. I'm growing in a greenhouse and... Uh, I don't know, it's it's not really practical for me to do light depth. And I'm wondering if anybody knows if it's possible to do what I've been trying to do, which is to supplement the sunlight in such a way that 
I can extend my growing season and, and get them to finish. I would also say just starting earlier, Brian, I think I've spoken with you before about that kind of issue because yes. I feel like, especially if you're in a greenhouse, I would say like trying to push and sometimes, you know, it just depends on the year. Some years in, in Oregon, we have uh, sunnier springs and some years we don't. So it kind of is like a little bit of a crapshoot, but I feel like adding supplemental light at the beginning of the season and some sort of, um, you know, there's various ways that you can keep your greenhouse from freezing if you don't have um, heat, you know, just by using, um, I don't know what your setup is like, but um, I, I have heat. Yeah, you have heat. So if you have heat, I would say, honestly, it's much easier to add supplemental light, like it's less light required if you're doing it in veg. And I was really impressed by, um, you know, just how early we've been able to kind of push things in the beginning of the year. Yeah, I ran uh, HIDs in there, and I this last year I ran them most of the year, uh, uh, partly because uh, you know it's chilly, gets it chilly, and it keeps my greenhouse warm. I just usually do it in the morning and a little in the evening. I I kind of tapered off during the hot weather. I also have LEDs. Sometimes I use those, but uh, I don't know. It just seemed like I could simulate a longer growing season somehow just by dealing with the environment in such a way that uh you know it thinks i'm in southern california or something what are the do you have the leaf on your genetic oh sorry sorry matt um but just really quick just if you could tell us like the um like what are these like longer because i i tend to find i strayed away from you know I don't know, it just depends on what you're doing. But as far as like the longer, if you're looking at a 12 week cultivar, then obviously you're going to have more issues. So I, I kind of tend to err on, um, I'm a big fan of quicks, especially these last years with the um, with the smoke and stuff. I'm not sure where you are in Oregon, but we've had to deal with, um, you know, different levels of smoke and that affects light as well. So I'm, a, I'm just, I've been kind of depending on where you're putting your production or what you're doing, what, what are you looking at on your weeks? Well, I've actually been, it's been uh, just take what I can get uh, at the dispensary because I've been running clones every year, but uh, I have ordered a bunch of seeds. I've already got a bunch of them. I'm planning to, uh, if it works out, to just do everything from seed this year uh, instead of doing the clones because they don't, I don't really get any choice. You know, you take what you get. That was going to be my question with the times because I'll say, so 2017, I grew White Widow um, and it finished a little too late, but because White Widow is um, super kind of like vigorous, it took it. Um, that's partially why I did it. Um, and then uh, didn't do anything 2018. 2019, I did Critical 2.0 and Lavender Outdoors. I did a Dom in a year or two, I think, in somewhere. Um, but essentially, oh, oh, and then I did also a heavy grapefruit in 2019 as well, a run outside and a couple others from BC seeds. And that's honestly, if you can source a lot of your genetics from like BC, um, like that's going to be some of your best bet because they're dealing with a lot of the same kind of uh, climate, like bioregion issues that we are not you know issues but the same kind of environment um that we are out here on the coast but i guess that's what i ran um you know like if that helps is white widow some critical 2.0 and then domina strains uh, or the black domina um heavy grapefruit and then uh, i can get the list for you brian and send it to you of the stuff i grew from bc seeds but yeah I think right. Brian yeah, that is makes in, sense. in Oregon. Brian, where um because if, if you're in Oregon also we, we provide clones to dispensaries. So I could I could let you know if you want to send me a message. I'm in Roseburg. Where, yeah, you're pretty close actually. And and sometimes it's uh you know, there are some really great um there are some great genetics that I have I have other friends. I mean we have quite a network of nurseries that provide clones to dispensaries in um in Oregon. So 
I'd be happy to point you in a direction where you can maybe find something shorter term. I mean, the one thing about seed that I will say is I'm a, I'm a huge fan. I mean, obviously like my Instagram handle is sister of the seed. I love seeds. I'm like a giant believer. Mm -hmm. I just feel like you will end up with more um, phenotypic variation. And so depending on what your goal is, if that doesn't matter to you, I, I love growing seed plants. I mean, so if I had a choice, that's all I would grow, but I do find that if you're trying to produce something that, you know, for production, it's very difficult to do because you end up with more phenotypic variation. So you end up with different, you know, if you want consistency, it's not always the best bet, unfortunately. Yeah, in Roseburg, I think most of the clones uh, are probably some, I mean, they must be from Oregon, right? Because they can't do it from out of yeah. state. Everything so I just figured dispensaries will come from Oregon. Right. And so this year, uh, with the seeds, I, I have done what you said. I, I, I didn't think about ordering from BC seeds, but I have uh, ordered, I tried to order from Oregon. And uh, I don't really know what I've got off the top of my head, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll have to look for uh, shorter flower times. Although I've, I've had great results with, uh, with what I've got here. It's just, uh, it, they don't always make it all the way. I, I think every I think you got an awesome avenue there. Every uh, being in Oregon and planting so many seeds and hunting through so many plants, I'm sure um, her company provides a lot of awesome stuff for the market. So if there's anybody in the world that I would love to get some plants from, it's you, Evian. Unfortunately, you can't ship them up to Canada, <laughs> but one of these days, one of these days, it will be possible. We are coming to the hour and thirty minutes. Do we answer your? question to completion did we go as deep as the root aphid does today for you Brian? yes uh it, it, with one exception uh since the problem i have here is they sell out so fast with the clones if i was looking for seeds uh would i drive to uh eugene or somewhere like that or because uh, i don't really see much around here you come to Southern Oregon too. I mean, there's places in Eugene, but you're if you're in Roseburg, you're so close to Southern Oregon, and there's a lot of places in Grand Pass, and there's a lot of places in Medford and Ashland. And Excellent. I mean, I have friends that are, you know, there's just so many breeders in the area, and now with the dispensaries offering more right. things, and same with clones well, and different things. Yeah, feel free I'll to reach out because I can. Thank yeah, you very I can much. hand you. I can head, I can send you to a couple places I know will have good have what you need. Right. And Thank you. you know, they might be a little bit more like naturalized too, because if you know they've been you know like put outside a couple of times and then brought back in, you know, you know, they have a lot more of uh you know that natural like resistance compared to some of these like clone guys, like there's you know, guys like selling stuff in like Portland that has never seen the sun ever, you know. And and that's kind of a big deal. Like I truthfully believe that every like genetic should at least have like, you know, at least a day of its life in the sun, at least just one, one day. I wish that was the truth, Matt. That's a, but you know, I will say that just as far as like if people consider, especially if you're sourcing clones and you're, you know, you are in a region where you are going to be growing outside and, you know, finding out because a lot of the time genetics that are meant for indoor production and when you're purchasing um, you know, the more knowledge you can get and people are getting better about this all the time uh, with, you know, it's like knowing like this does better with indoor production versus outdoor production. Um, and if you are doing outdoor production or greenhouse, there is a lot of um, thought that should be put to things that come from your bioregion and have been grown in your bioregion and do well in that region. So we just had that little discussion about somebody asking a question about stuff for the coast versus somebody asking a question about something kind of more in like a mountainous inland area. And so, you know, if you are going to try and source something for your area, considering if it's spent its whole life indoor and then you're gonna, you know, the, the genetic you're purchasing is something that has been cultivated for indoor production, it's gonna perform differently outside. So that's kind of a, maybe something not talked about enough, but, uh, things acclimatize to bioregion uh, genetics do. So a cannabis cultivar that's been grown in Southern Oregon will probably do better for Brian than something that was grown, you know, uh, on the coast in Vancouver. Uh, so that's, uh, that's kind of like my general feeling on those things. 
All right, Gravy, I just turned off the, the hands raised sign. You have the last question of the evening. You always like to drop in for the last bomb question. So what's up, brother? Sorry about that. Um, no, my question, I, I just came up with it. So I was eating dinner, and I love the conversation. Um, I was just wondering, the people that know the breeders, are they digging up their tap roots from outside, bringing them inside, and trying to breed with them again? Because that's what I've been trying to do. I had my plants outside for the summer. I planted them in the beginning of... Um, uh april and then they finally popped up we had some frost and shit like that and then i dug it up um november and then let it finish inside and now it's re-vegged and i'm gonna flower and pollinate it so i just was wondering if anybody else is trying to get two different types of batches with one particular cultivar or strain I think that's badass that you did that. I, I joke sometimes that the true sign of a master grower is being able to like re, re veg plants, especially when you're digging them up and bringing them back in with that dedication. So I just want to honor you for doing that. Uh, I think that's really, um, that's really cool. And, you know, I, I would personally feel like the yield may not, if you're doing it for flower, I would say, I don't know if you're going to get like quite the yield you're looking for on something like that. But if you're doing it for breeding, I think that's awesome. And, uh, and I think that's just a fantastic way to go when you find something like that. And if you can also, you know, if you want to clone those, I, what I would do is clone those things before I moved on and then um, work with the uh, clonal kind of brain not working but the, the, I would work with the um, the clones I would re -veg it then I would clone it and then I would work with the clones because then you're going to end up with more um, you know or you could just work with the breeding on what you have there but that would be how I would do it personally is making sure that I'm also saving that genetic if I went to all the trouble to re -veg it if, if I can say as well like what I, I think that's badass too but one what one piece of note is when you go in and out with plants um, they're, they're, you usually create some some ideal opportunities for for certain predatory insects and, and molds to arise very very quickly. Um, so do do be cautioned with that and make sure you're doing your due diligence. Azer um, have a halfway process if you have a, a grow inside that you're bringing them into um, that that you can ensure that there might not be something there or have some defenses set up in your system already that would mitigate these problems to begin with. Yeah, that's the conversation we had with epigenetics the other day, um, well, yesterday, but um, I, I let the pest persist. So if you looked at my Instagram, you would see things that make you kind of go, what the fuck are you doing, bro? Because I've got some pretty heavy two-spotted spider mite pressure. I wanted to see which cultivars, um, well, which cuts would actually do well or tap roots would actually do well indoors so i have aphid pressure and two spotted spider mites and thrips and some other things um but yeah i dug up the tap roots and only a few survived the revegging and now it has the two spotted spider mites and uh the only ipm i'm really doing is diatomaceous earth or taking them into the shower i just want to get an epigenetic response so yeah i'm, I'm kind of like doing it on purpose just to see what will survive in the wind tunnel of shame as i call it so i don't know i i just was wondering if anybody else was doing it thank you very much for the answer thanks for your time tonight guys that's cool gravy i just want to say that's cool but you know i i just uh i don't know i, I mean i personally if it's something that you, you care about and you want you went to all that trouble i would just say you know maybe treating we brought up a couple of things earlier like i know that we had a conversation about stuff oil x earlier and it's such an easy, low key, uh, low key treatment that just works wonders. So if you have spider mites, just hit it every three days with stuff oil X, and you will see they will go away. <laughs> and um, aphids, we we had a whole discussion about also, but there's there's some you know, I don't know. I, I would say that the taproot too is like. I'd be curious. I mean, that's kind of a deeper conversation and maybe we don't have time for it, but just like the, like your goal with the taproot would kind of be my other question. Like why exactly that's mattering to you or 
or what you're looking for with that because it you know it only really sustains for so long especially if it's something that has um you know that you've brought back in and is revegging so it's just interesting like what what's the goal with the taproot per, uh, personal preference because basically nine out of ten people that i talk to are saying cut clones so i'm i'm usually the guy that spits into the wind to see which cheek it lands on okay gotcha because because it really you know it, it matters sometimes and i do i mean i obviously i love seed plants but i will say that like um you know it it doesn't always um I mean, that's how we hunt things, right? We hunt generally from seed plants and then we cut clones. And if you want the genetics to, you know, persevere and hold on to them so you can work with them or do other things with them. So it's kind of like a, it's a both and equation in my mind that you can, you can have both. Um, but if there's no other goal besides just the fact that you like it, you know, it's like maybe there's a little bit more to like ponder there. I, I would I'm gonna say gravy like no I don't mean that I mean that with the utmost respect and I love having you on my stage but I am never getting clones from you my friend <laughs> this adds up I'm just I'm never gonna ask for clones <laughs> I, I but I, I appreciate what you're doing at the same time I didn't mean that in any insult I think it's kind of interesting that you're just kind of going for it. I like to I like to break the rules too I might not pee into the wind but I'm definitely gonna break a few rules in my life yeah, I, well, I said spit. I don't want piss on my face, but <laughs> but uh, no, nah, I I um I'm having my buddy take over um because I'm I'm uh, gonna rent out my house and the grow goes along with it. So we're gonna cut clones from all the tap roots, get rid of the pest pressure, dip all the clones, and move forward with rooting clones. And and the tap roots were just something that I did over the last three years or so it was just a personal preference um but we're going to move forward with a different program in general and it's definitely going to have ipm involved i just wanted to do as much as i could over the last three years and just kind of the painstaking effort of seeing what dies and what lives and breed with that and and now that i've been able to do that and see that i can reveg stuff from outside i've kind of gotten it out of my system and I'm going to do it as if it was um, when I work in a commercial facility and just make sure everything's clean and, and quick and time is money kind of attitude. It's also about the journey, brother. So I do appreciate that. I didn't mean to like chew on it. <laughs> but Evie, did you want to say something there? And then we'll close out the. I just wanted to say that um, there's a lot of different things that when you do dip, make sure that you're um, generally when you do your dips, you don't use full strength. So I'd be curious, um, you know, when you do get to that point, you can't, Cephal Oil X is another one of those products you can use. I don't remember the exact formula off the top of my head. I believe it's like a quarter strength um, for when you're dipping clones, specifically for spider mites. But sometimes there's something you can use that will work for both aphids and um, you know, if you have multiple pest pressures. But dipping, if you have to, I mean, obviously, clean mothers, taking cuts from clean mothers is best practice, but that's not always the way it works. So just dipping clones is a common practice. They don't always love it, but it is uh, beneficial just to make sure that you're you know, that your propagation comes off clean and that you're actually saving what you want and not, you know, keeping the problem going. So it's a good, good tactic, but just be cautious when you do dip. Yeah. Worst case scenario, we just start from seeds again. It's not, a, it's not a big deal. I, I think I've gotten it out of my system. And, and when I hand it over to somebody else, if he just wants to cut everything down and then we'll start from fresh, it's, it's quite all right with me. It was a fun journey. It was a good three years, a solid three years. So I, I don't mind starting from seed again. It, it, it's almost exciting to start a new project like that. And with that, um, we look forward to hearing about them on the regular gravy because I, I want updates on the regular. I love having you up, come up on stage and ask questions. You always, you always bring a good zinger here, here or there, and I appreciate it. So don't stop doing that um, and, and keep it coming. I'm just going to say thank you to all the people out in future candidates project that came along for the show today everybody else in the audience all the panel member all the panel cheddar bob and i had to go a little bit early they were doing something um evian matt johnny uh we had jason in here earlier 
who else? I'm missing one more, aren't I? Man, I thought it was Thursday. Like, I came on Clubhouse to, like, go like, <laughs> into, like, Jason's room. And then I was like, oh, my God, wait, it's Wednesday. Go Please. check that out. Jason does an awesome show on, on, on Thursday nights. It'll be tomorrow at, at, at 7 o'clock. So thanks again, all the, all the creators. And be back next week um, to join us for another episode of uh, Ask the Cannabis Nerds. Um, Cancer Order Call to 101, uh, where we diagnose your plants or talk about something challenging. Thank you all. appreciate you and have a wonderful day. I'm going to leave the room open on the clubhouse side so you make sure to follow everybody that is here so that you, you make friends. Friends are good. Have a good night, everyone. What do you mean? How long do you guys let me go? How lo every time I go so long and you just let me talk and I, you can't hear anything. I'm just talking away. But anyways, I'm going to give you a quick run through because I just said everything so smoothly and so nicely. And now I got to say it again. So we'll run through. We have happening very, very shortly. Oh, Christ's sakes. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. We have happening shortly at 7 o'clock. We have Seed Collectors Volume 4. I don't know if it's Volume 4. It's Seed Collectors happening at 7 with Chad. We then have tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. We have Brian and Layton showing up uh, for an amazing conversation as, as happens every Thursday in the morning. Then at 1 p.m. we have an awesome time where we're going to get some of... We have uh, one of Bob Snodgrass's disciples and a couple other glass artists, and we're going to be um, gather what we're, a new episode, which we'll call Gathering Glass on Channel 2. Um, it'll be a lot of fun, so don't miss out on that. There'll be fire involved. So if you want to come, maybe there might be fire. I'm not going to make any promises, but I'm pretty sure there's fire involved in this show. So if you want to see some stuff on fire, possibly, and, and have a lot of fun with some amazing people, come over at 1 o'clock tomorrow on FBC02. And then later on that evening, we have Joda Herb. Joda Herb has this awesome show where he's going to be chatting with the organ. Ah, oh, shit, Christ, six. Uh, where we will, he will be talking with, talk with the organic cultivators about the Supernatural Conference, which will be very exciting. Um, my hair is giant, bushy, and big. Thank you all for hanging out and enjoying the conversation and taking part in today's show. Uh, we will be back every week, like we are every week. So I'm going for the Bob Ross of cannabis. Does it work? You tell me. Let me know in the comments. I'd appreciate that. But anyways, don't go anywhere. Actually, go somewhere. Go to the washroom. Have a bite to eat. But come right back here for a great episode. What the f... Yell into the mic. And for another great episode. Cannabis Project.
Thank you, and we appreciate you all. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Southern. Can I yell any louder? I don't know. I gotta work on that. It's gotta work on. Thank you. We're over. It's done.